Um, I'm ready to start. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. So I'm Clara. I'm a researcher working in science and technology studies, and I also work in history and philosophy of astrobiology. I'm a member of the European Astrobiology Initiative called Origins, and uh, I'm currently co-leading work on the Astrobiology White Paper, looking into societal implications of astrobiology research in Europe. And I'm going to tell you something about the commercial conquests of the solar system. And basically, I ask the question, with recent developments in space, is the outer space really available on the first come, first serve basis? But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, looking into history and context. Then I'm going to talk about perspectives which we've already seen a little bit about extrasolar planets in a, in, a, in a talk earlier today. And then I want to ask, ask a couple of questions about future, because astrobiology and space commerce is typically the field that there is more questions than answers, because it's a massive societal change that's happening right now, right here, and we are just trying to make sense of it and perhaps see what's going to happen next. So I'm going to start with what I call, or what is called the first space race. Um, I'm sure you're going to be familiar with what the space race was. So basically it was a competition between the US and the USSR. You see Moscow and Washington. Uh, it was a competition to succeed in exploring uh, the space. So. The first, one of the first, not the first one, but one of the first successes in, in the space history was uh, first man in space in 1961 when Yuri Gagarin completed an orbit of the Earth and humankind has officially entered the space age. And as you know, Gagarin became a celebrity, traveled through the world. There is another important person and you can't actually read the text, but it's, um, it's Alexei Leonov on his historically first spacewalk, leaving the Vostov spaceship. What well, is not known that it was nearly a disaster because his space suit inflated and it was very difficult for him to actually enter back uh, to the space craft, but he survived, luckily. Um, and here we go, Neil Armstrong, he descends a ladder to become the first human to step onto the surface of the moon, Apollo 11, in July 1969. And here we have uh, Eugene Cernan, um, Apollo 17 astronaut, which was the final mission of the Apollo program in 1972. Another interesting thing is the first uh, Mars landing by uh, Viking 1. So what you see here, the first ever photograph of Martian surface, 1966, uh, 1976, sorry. And here, the first ever photograph taken on Venus. It was the Russian success. It was Venera spacecraft landed in 1982. And that's the only photograph we received because the spacecraft melted due to the uh, atmospheric conditions on Venus. So it's not really a welcoming environment, as you can imagine. And this makes me think about what is really the icon of our age, of, of the first wave of space age. And I think, uh, and it's presented in popular media and other publications worldwide, is the bootprint made by Neil Armstrong or perhaps Buzz Aldrin. Actually, the surroundings of, of the moon lander is covered in boot prints, so we can't tell which one of them was first and who made the actual print. But nevertheless, this is the key symbol of the space age, and it's used to illustrate the success of the US space program. So on the way, uh, to Europe on a flight, I watched the Independence Day. And one of the opening sequences is, you actually see the blueprint, and when the alien spaceship arrives, it, 
there is this shaking on the, and then the footprint disappears. So that is the attack on humanity. And I thought to myself, good, I have it in the presentation. It actually works. Um, so there we go. This is NASA's description. The footprints left by the astronauts in the Sea of Tranquility are more permanent than most solid structures on Earth. They possibly last for millions of years. Here we have go, a first human population orbiting our planet. Uh, this is Mir, Mir space station. Mir is the word for peace. Um, active 1986 to 2001. Um, here you see Mir as uh, pictured by the departing space shuttle Endeavour in 1998. Well, eventually, as we can see, the Cold War ended and the two rivals decided to pursue a joint adventure, which is the International Space Station. Here pictured, uh, as seen in 2010, from the departing space shuttle Atlantis, STS-132 in 1998. So you see, it's an entirely, it was entirely new trend of two rivals really pursuing a joint adventure exploring the outer space, and you had astronauts from different countries uh, taking part in the research programs conducted on lower orbit. And now, it's not just Russia and America anymore. We have new powers or new countries entering the space race, and this is China, which who you see here is the first Chinese female astronaut and pilot a crew member of the space mission in 2012. She became to be first Chinese woman in space. The first woman was Russian. So here we go. And uh, there are people who think that actually when we explore universe, we shouldn't put a flag on it. And act on behalf of nation, but we should represent mankind because we are now all members of one planet, which is something I'm going to show you later. So this is US initiative, uh, one flag in space. So what you see on this picture is Earth, uh, but it's, it's connected. It, the picture is made out of hundreds of little pictures picturing different parts of, the, of this planet, and uh, it gives um, uh, a presentation of Earth as one planet. It's, um, this is artist concept, obviously it's not, a, it's not a photograph, that's a vision of the future of how things could or should be. There's this normative dimension to it. And it brings me to question of new perspective, and that is what is outer space and exploration in third millennium, because we are all on the verge of a new millennium. And uh, one of the uh, I think most important um, pictures is, or notions, is the first photograph of Earth that was taken in 1996. Um, this is a really interesting photograph from space history. So what you see here is that the photograph was taken by Apollo astronaut Michael Collins. But he's Given the fact that he has the other two astronauts descending onto lunar surface and with Earth on the background, he's actually the only human, alive or dead, that isn't in the frame of this picture. Everybody else who's ever lived is on that picture except for him. Um, this obviously has enormous impact on astronauts themselves. So here you have um, a nice... Um, description of it by Frank Borman, an Apollo 8 astronaut, who says, when you're finally up at the moon looking back on Earth, all these differences are pretty well going to blend. And you just think, why the beep <laughs> can't we learn to live together like decent people? This is called the overview effect. Um, it's the cognitive shift in awareness reported by some astronauts when they actually view the Earth from orbit. I had a privilege to interview one of the STS-119 Discovery astronauts, and he says, I've never ever felt so insignificant in my entire life. 
when you're there and you see that tiny little blue planet, it feels so fragile and you feel very lonely. So that's the overview effect as experienced by astronauts. Obviously, this hasn't um, escaped the interest of social scientists and historians of science. And um, the air photographs taken during the Apollo missions, that is from 1968 to 1972, with all the representations of Earth, um, has been described um, and impact of it on contemporary Western ge geological imagination. And from the first time in history, we had this spectacular view, and this is the second iconic image I'm going to present today, and that is the blue marble, um, as seen from the outer space. And it has, this global vision obviously has terrestrial impact. So in 1987, when the United Nations and the World Commission on Environment and Development opened their report, they, for the first time in recorded history, were addressing our common future, opening the entire publication saying from space, we see a small and fragile ball dominated not by human activity, but by patterns of cloud, oceans, greenery and soils. And this notion of global as a result of the space exploration program became an environmental icon. And as Chomsky rightly pointed out, there is a political dimension to it, because obviously to succeed in a space um, also means gaining control over um, our planet. Uh, so I did a little bit of research. Um, where can you see this global perspective reflected? So you see, we see global impact uh, global health, global economy, uh, global problems. And it's this simple change of perspective. But I believe we can take it a bit further than that. So this is Earth as seen from Mars, from the distance of, and I forgot the number, which is typically what happens to me, so sorry. I'm going to look it up for you later. So the tiny little dot is our planet as seen from Mars. Well, I'm not sure if you see it. On, can you tell where Earth is on that picture? OK, I'm going to stand up. Sorry. So, the tiny little blue dot over here is Earth as pictured from the distance of 6 billion kilometers by Voyager, Voyager spacecraft, the first or second man-made object ever left a living solar system. And here we go. Not only we members of one planet, but our planet is one of the many, as presented earlier today in this wonderful presentation. And so far we have 3,496 confirmed exoplanet, but as I found out yesterday, there's been 10 more. <laughs> so. As you can see, it changes every day, depending on the data we receive and the interpretation of it. And uh, we can go even further than that. We also found out that our galaxy, our Milky Way, is one of the many galaxies. And this is the latest um, representation of what our universe, entire universe, can look like. So the strings you see, the spaghetti-like structures are strings of galaxies. So Milky Way is that red spot, that is where it's located. And in the changing world, how we not only change perspective about what is life on Earth, how we relate to it, what is our space in the universe, but also how we relate and use outer space. And here we go. That's what I would describe as a second wave of space race, and that is related to commercial space exploration. So I'm sure you all have seen this on media or newspapers. This is a plan for space tourism. You can actually buy a ticket, which I did, I tried, I subscribed. It's very expensive, and you ask to provide a 
percent deposit, which was around about twenty-three thousand dollars. So I decided I'm going to wait for the sales <laughs> <laughs> because obviously it's about quarter million. Um, so let's see how it goes. But it's Virgin Galactic. It's Richard Branson, famous entrepreneur, owner of Virgin Group. Uh, they have. Uh, this Virgin Galactic, widely discussed for media, especially after the first bookings were made. Um, their vision of the future was quite optimistic. Uh, they've been postponing the, the, the launch, so we shall see how it goes in the near future. Nevertheless, <clears throat> we do have what is called spaceports uh, built in, on Earth. Um, it's used it's going to be used for the space tourism, but at the minute it's used to launch commercial satellites. So as you can see, lower orbit is being used for communications and mapping, and uh, we use mobile technology on an everyday basis. We watch satellite TV, but it's all managed on the lower orbit of Earth, um, and mostly done by uh, private companies, right? So if you remember or you recall the map I presented earlier with just two places, uh, this is uh, the 21st century situation where you have um, spaceports um, all over the world, including um, the Middle East, Australia, Japan, and other places. So quite a change and, and development in the balance of powers, I would say. One of the most discussed, um, let's say, developments these days would be the space economy, which has also been described as a modern day gold rush. Some people also claim that the first trillionaire is going to be the one that's going to earn the money in, uh, during the space mining. So basically, the plan or the vision is to build something like this. Uh, Again, this is um, an artist concept of how the future could look like. It's not the actual asteroid. It's, it's uh, two images combined with a little mining device um, harvesting the resources. Some people go a bit further than that, and they imagine we're going to have actual colonies on Mars with uh, human workers um, managing the, the installation, we shall see. But to some people, myself included, uh, this raises a lot of questions about what are the policies and how to really relate to astronomical objects. Are they environmental objects that are for us to use? to be used, or are they something that should be left and left alone because it belongs to everybody? Well, um, space activities as conducted by the US and USSR to date, and other, were, anyway, were uh, regulated by what is called the Moon Treaty. It's the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of, of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space. It entered into force in 1967, and it explicitly says that the outer space exploration shall be providence of all mankind. It's free for exploration, and it's not a subject to national appropriation by claim. So that is 1967. Yet, uh, the, the, this is a very interesting one. Um, this is Antarctica Treaty. Uh, it was a similar treaty regulating how, because Antarctica didn't belong to anybody, so it was an agreement of how you conduct scientific exploration in Antarctica, which is unclaimed place. But it all changed in 2015, in December, when former president of United States, Obama, signed the Private Aerospace Competitiveness and Entrepreneurship Act, stating that the US, US government is going to foster the condition for economic growth and technological advancement of the US space commerce industry. Now, we, we're still trying to work out how the two connect and what really governs what. 
but it's not entirely clear. Uh, this is obviously this applies to American area. We are not clear how we gonna work with this in Europe, uh, especially now when Luxembourg uh, announced the space mining initiative. Um, you can check the website. It's, it's quite interesting. So as you can see from the new space age with making technologies available, uh, we have quite a couple of business opportunities, we can call it. It's not only space travel, but zero G experience, uh, but as you can go on a shuttle and they do this ecliptic, right? So we experience zero gravity field, mining on moon and extraterrestrial real estate, which is something I would really like to mention in context with what I said earlier about uh, the Moon Treaty, because you have companies who actually sell land on Moon, Venus and Mars. I personally find it unlogical. Why would you s sell land on Venus when the veneer is pre-scraft literally melted within like minute of landing, but still, irrespective of what I think, you can actually buy the land. So. Um, we may even ask the question, maybe NASA and other space agencies should really consider buying the land so that they can secure landing sites for their missions. But then again, this is to show the unclarity on what governs what and what is the legal frame in which the space commerce is going to take place and unfold. So as you can see, it was from 16 pound, it's like 20 euro. You can buy land. You can also buy a star and name it you're going to get your own map. Um, but then again, the scientists would say that they would still use their own map, so it doesn't really affect the science practice, but it is possible. So marketability of outer space. We see that commerce conquested the interstellar places. Not So we're shifting from exploration to exploitation for research and conquest. But what I would like to mention here for you today is also that on a new level, outer space is still a place where we target our aspirations, sentiments and rituals. And it also, in a, in a very interesting way, happens in context with commerce. Um, okay, this is not right. We have another technical thing. No, okay. I'm going to... What did I do? What did I do? What a day today. <laughs> Whatever I touch it doesn't work today. But at least I made it to Madrid on time. Anyway, I'm going to start with Mars One Project. Um, you might have heard of it. The idea is to send a group of people on one-way mission to Mars. One-way mission means that they're going to set a colony there and die there. Yes, there is no way for them to return back. There is no such technology available today that would bring them back in case anything happens. Um, the way they envisioned to fund this enterprise was to create a reality show out of it, and that's how you fund the whole thing. Well, it might be a nice vision of a near future, but it's very problematic given we really don't know what would be the effect of radiation on human body in a long-term perspective. We can, from the data from the Apollo program and from the ISS, we know that radiation and long-term stay in space affects human body on a substantial basis. So there is no way to tell what's going to happen on Mars, and if I may to present a weird idea, imagine, so you, you have a person on a one-way mission to Mars, the person exposed to a high dosage of radiation gets cancer. There is no way, you know, in terrestrial conditions, it's very hard, if not impossible, to treat some types of cancer. So are we really going to sit in front of our screens watching an astronaut dying and, and this is the way to fund this whole enterprise? Um, so I was in a public debate um, and I voted against um, there is not as many news on this program in media these days, so I believe uh, they might decide to not to pursue. But then again, we have a new player 
in the game, and that is Elon Musk, who presents very ambitious plans of Mars colonization in a very new feature. There are no, not much details about how he envisions to do this, but we shall find out very soon. It also looks that NASA Mars exploration program is now in competition with the Elon Musk one. So it's really a question, who's going to get into Mars first? We don't know. Um, this is perhaps interesting for art artists. This is uh, an actual installation by Kelly Richardson. And it's a picture of the actual museum landscape it's actual landscape created in a museum, sorry. And what it shows is a mess that's been left after the Mars exploration. It's a very interesting visual critique of, of uh, human activity in outer space and how it may turn out for the environment over there. So well, I would like to say that the outer space is not an empty cultural sterile vacuum of intact nature. It is actually still a place where the new meanings and knowledge are produced. And there is one special space commerce I mentioned earlier I would like to tell you about today. And that is Celestis uh, space flight, which you see here is a, is a launch of a rocket uh, from Colorado in 2013. And what they do, they allow, they enable their clients to send a small portion of cremated remains into the space. So it's a Houston-based company. Um, it's, it's basically a new ash scattering uh, service um, as conducted in a space age for a little fee of $1,000 you can have. Uh, the cremated remains, the ashes sent to orbit. There is another option of having it sent to moon. And the most expensive one, obviously, is uh, to be sent to the interplanetary space and perhaps beyond, which is the option the Star Trek creator Gene Rudenberry uh, purchased for him and his wife. Um, Another interesting question, imagine if the such capsules land on moon and then you have a mining company next to it and a space program landing. So are we going to consider this place as, as a cemetery, which is in our culture a sacred place, which is un untouchable? So how are we going to, how would this work? Hard to say. I'm speculating a lot today, but that's what it is. Um, Again, I didn't click the right thing. <laughs> so these are the capsules. As you can see, they have many clients, if I dare to name it this way. Each capsule contains a small portion of it. It's been already described as American way of death. Um, it's the commercial enterprise and the, the emergence of what is called consumer spirituality of, or posthumous tourism <laughs> within the tradition of ice scattering. <laughs> Uh, here we see this great tension in imaginary of technoscience. It's also the bringer of transcendence. It's a new, new way of, new meaning of our relation to outer space. So uh, my conclusion is that our universe has been contested not only ideologically, politically in the past, scientifically in our explorations, but these days also commercially. And uh, this brings me to last section of my talk, and that is really thinking about our common future, as we've seen in the Brundtland report, how the question relates to the new millennium, and really what are our common problems. And we already have problems. So what you see here is a front screen of a space shuttle Challenger that's been hit by a fragment uh, of a space debris. Uh, this is the orbit, and this image shows how much space junk there is. So we have a new initiative, it's called Clean Space One. Uh, basically, it's, it's, a, it's a little um, spacecraft just collecting uh, the rubbish from the orbit and clearing it out. You might have seen gravity. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit... Obviously, it's a bit dramatized, but still, 
we will have to clean the orbit from human activity already because it's becoming more and more dangerous for astronauts to go on a spacewalk or even, as you can see, this is a hit that um, um, sustained uh, a Challenger space shuttle. So um, I'm going to summarize about what is the new space age. We see there's been significant developments in space exploration. And in a way, we see the outer space and how we relate to it, what is our place in it. We see that space technologies are now available on international basis. I've only mentioned China, but also India has a very ambitious space program. We say that space technologies are available for purchase. That means that you can buy them if, if you have the money. And we witness emergence of outer space economy. And that obviously brings new opportunities, but a lot of challenges, which I try to illustrate on a simple chart graph. So we see the intersection between commerce, environment, and science. And then it gets more complicated because we have risks. Uh, we have development, which, you know, these things are happening as we speak. So it's likely going to happen. We can't prevent it from happening. And it's get even more complicated because we don't know who owns the space. That is the big, big question we're trying to, to answer these days. Uh, how it's going to be regulated? Uh, are we going to have some sort of international treaty or are the activities going to be managed on a national level? We don't know. There is this big issue of planetary protection that is bringing the actual resources to Earth, how it's going to affect Earth environment and can it really pose risk to um, the um, mile system of Earth, on Earth? And then we have sustainability, how we really keep a, a peaceful use of outer space, how we take this forward. So we have even more complex issues. And my question is, what is going to be the new space age icon? We've seen a blueprint, we've seen the small planet. And in our, my work today, I'm trying to really find out is it going to be extrasolar planets or the vision of Martian colonies or even the actual Martian colonies? Is it going to be life discovered beyond Earth, meaning primitive life on Europa and, and or even on Mars? We don't know that. And that is the question I ask myself. And I thank you for your attention, for your patience with why we were getting the technology sorted. And I'm more than happy to take and answer your questions. How much time do we spend? Do we? It's perfect. Okay. 35 minutes. Does anyone have a question? We're running kind of okay on time. Así que yo tengo alguna pregunta, pero evidentemente si alguien quiere lanzarse con una está más que bienvenido. Okay, so I'll start. Um, okay. It's thank you for the fascinating overview because it's really I mean thinking like after listening to Lisa and also in anticipation on. Oh, on Julie's yeah, keynote, yeah. it's going to be really an enriching um, panel to actually sit here ourselves critically, politically, and also speculative on how we are projecting and dealing also with all the all the politics that that implies, mm -hmm. now in material terms and as well as in as in desires or projections, no, and yes. that are constituting those imaginaries. I couldn't stop myself thinking when you uh, uh, showed us a quote that said how outer space is thought as being a uh, culture blank, no? To see how it is exactly mirror on how colonial conquest exactly, was yes. developed. Now, how um, the colonized countries were looked as cultural blanks and territories full of resources that could be plundered, that could be exploited. And so mm. the 
colonizing mission would be to actually to transpose and to impose a cultural rationale with an imperial logic. Absolutely, and we yes. all know how it goes. So I don't know if you could, what are your thoughts on this, or how can you also bridge these two temporalities and oh, yes, absolutely. mechanisms? Um, that's why I mentioned the Antarctica Treaty. Uh, that's uh, the space commerce researchers use this treaty to really explain how we relate to outer space as an environment that is there for us to use. So Antarctica is quite open to peaceful science exploration until after, of course, they discovered some mineral resources under the, 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 the ice crust, yes. So, and then the, the, the territorial claims would start. It's the same case with seabed. So until it was found out that there could be some potential um, resources um, there, no one really cared about seabed. It was mm -hmm. the famous, I think, uh, dispute between uh, Turkey and Cyprus mm -hmm. when they found oil on a seabed. And then, obviously, the fight was who's going to access it first and, and what part of the seabed belongs to who. So, absolutely, there is parallel to it. And also, the way we think about our environment is now projected to outer space. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the question that the way it seems to be unfolding now, it's on this first arrived, first served basis. Who's mm -hmm. going to get there first is going to get the resources that can, can claim the territory and use it as they please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it actually could also, what, what was really interesting in connection to the image by mm -hmm. uh, uh, Kelly Livingstone, I can't yes, remember the, her name. The, that it's really interesting how it's actually connected a kind of like spiral mm -hmm. of Yes. This acceleration is plundering of mm -hmm. like one, mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. one planet, then we go to the next one. And Absolutely. What I usually use in context with that is um, the sad story of Everest, which is typically, um, it's a very, ex it's, it's called extreme tourism. So you would have dead bodies over there. You would have human waste over there. You would pay a lot of money to get there and, and reach the summit, risking you're going to lose life and still you have dozens of people going there, just covering the face of the dead body to not to see it and just crossing it. So there is a lot of ethical questions um, as far as, as human values are concerned, but also environment concerns. Uh, that is that Nepali government um, put a new regulation in place that every tourist will have to bring a portion of human waste, by which I mean feces, mm -hmm. um, and bring it back from Everest because it's now covered in, in waste. And you see, it's, it's extreme environment, it's dangerous for human life, but when you look at the pictures, it's quite um, and not interesting. It's a bit shocking how the mountain is covered in, or the base camp is basically covered in, in, in waste and mess. Yeah. So. ¿Alguna pregunta? If not, maybe I will ask about the reality show that you mentioned, because I think it's really interesting to use this kind of strategy when we're looking about colonization, you know, that far was away. The, that was the plan. And the point of view. That was the plan. Okay. But it seems it's not going to happen, okay. and I would actually hope it's not going to happen. But it was this idea that you're going to get the, f the money for making reality shows so you know you can have people engage with science and witness the actual colonization and exploration of Mars, which the idea, it's, it's a terrestrial model of funding things, but if you imagine, so you go to Mars, so you on a way for like a year, you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you do science. Mm -hmm. You eat, you sleep, you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you do science, you eat you sleep. And that's what the astronauts are supposed to be doing on the way to Mars because it's such a long trip. So uh, people were asking like, wouldn't people be bored? Or how are you gonna mm -hmm. take this? So I don't think it's gonna work actually. But it's my personal opinion. I have no uh, reference about it whatsoever.
Yes, just to add to this last comment about um, Mars colonists maybe being bored of, of their life on Mars, is recently there was a mini strike at the on the ISS. Like the actual astronauts were fed up with having to work all day and have no leisure, no privacy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. They now also have their own coffee machine. So for me, they will personally work. I'll just have my cup of coffee and, and they have this small observatory over there so they can actually have some free time just to, to observe like Earth. And uh, they take hundreds of photographs. Uh, you also have live feed. Uh, so you can see the, the space station floating. So, you know, I'm not surprised. It's, it's a typical the psychology of the group. How, how, that's another problem with Mars exploration. How do you manage the group? Um, you are, what is the ideal size of the group? They say minimum three people, but um, I cannot imagine how. It's a very complex thing. Uh, robotic exploration of solar system is very efficient. And there is, not, there is no human factor involved in it. Once you try to put a human, you always have to deal with other things. That is how to sustain human life, psychology, and other things. Another worrying issue for me about Martian colonies is the plan to um, create or uh, to have babies on Mars. Mm -hmm. How would this uh, affect the human body? Um, we know that the human body depends extremely on terrestrial conditions. How would it affect the, the, the different gravity and distance from the sun and other factors I cannot even Im imagine? Uh, how would it affect the, the, the physiology and psychology of that, let's say, native Martian? We don't know. It's a very, it's a speculative thing. But uh, NASA launched a, a Mars exploration program, so uh, they are currently uh, making sense of the data coming from the ISS. We had an astronaut spending one year on the orbit to obviously explore the long-term uh, exposure and its effect on human body. So we shall see, and we shall see what the next icon is going to be. We have one last question. Okay. Yeah. I'm working on a text that's about a sort of like cinematic imagination of outer space, comparing the two movies, one called Moon yeah. with, and one called Elysium. Yes, I and know to yeah. summarize um, how I'm working the dynamics of it is that in Elysium, essentially, you have the super wealthy sort of like using the outer space as sort of like a gated community, Absolutely. right? And then, but it's where science is reaching its sort of like frontiers where like all the health problems are solved. And then in Moon, you have human labor, the most sort of like uh, rudimentary one, being performed uh, through like a... Yeah. It's a, a clone actually. Yeah, and, and then you realize that this labor is actually yes. a clone, yes. and the clone realize that he's a clone, mm -hmm. right? And how, and how these two sort of like... Uh, so like relate to these two sides of our our imagination of like mm. what is the use of what what is the u use of space and so like uh, as as much as I sort of like like moon I I kind of like feel like the aesthetics of moon is what I like but um, I think I think I will end up on the side of uh, Elysium more sort of like more sort of like. I, um, I was wondering, like, what, have you thought about these films or have you thought about other films that yeah. sort of like explore yeah. your question? Because um, cinema has dealt, or science fiction has dealt with a lot of this. It, it was a very favorite part of my um, uh, PhD when I had to watch all of my favorite science fiction films all over again. Um, so it was good field work for me. Um, Absolutely. Uh, what I presented earlier was slightly normative view, so I really tried to point out to, to possible ethical issues and politics of, of the contemporary space exploration. But you're absolutely right with Moon. Um, first thing, I don't understand why a robot or a clone has to have a human face. So that could be just presented for the sake of the story. But with Elysium, we just had this amazing conversation about, should we colonize Mars? Uh, we agreed we shouldn't. Uh, it was Astrobiology and Society workshop in Princeton last week. So uh, we shouldn't, unless, of course, we destroy Earth. And 
we will need to su survive to, to ensure that human race is going to survive, in which case we could colonize and terraform Mars. And the first question we had, okay, who's gonna go first? And that was the case of Elysium. It was the wealthy, rich people who could afford to live on that beautiful um, space station. I think it is also on the, on this symposium program. It's mm -hmm. a vision of yep. what yeah. this this colony could look like. While the poor ones stayed on Earth uh, and they were providing resources for uh, the safe and clean um, future environment on the orbit. So. Again, it's the vision of how the society works, um, representing in in um, extraterrestrial environment. You can, I, you know, with science fiction studies, you can approach it from so many different perspectives that I wouldn't know which one to choose right now. But it's a social critique, I think. With Moon, um, it's more for me at the ethics of using. Um, or cloning humans and implanting them with what they think is reality. And when they found out it's not real, it presents an existential crisis to them, which they are unable to cope with. But I, I don't want to talk about it because I don't think uh, everybody's familiar with Moon, but happy to talk about it later. Thank you so much, Clarana. It was my pleasure. Thank you.